Hello. Uh, so, as some of you might know, I'm not uh, Dr. Finley, um, uh, <laughs> but it's okay. Uh, so he sends his regards. Um, so he couldn't make it uh, last minute today. So uh, I'm here. Uh, I'm a graduate student in the lab uh, working in this area. So I'd just like to first thank uh, the organizers, uh, Lita and others, uh, for the invitation. Um, and uh, also, um, uh, I'm, I'm the one of the ones working here in microbiome and vaccines, and we're just still in the early days um, in this area. Uh, but I'd just like to present more of a conceptual talk of you know, where the field is and you know, possibly where it's going. Um, so I don't really think I need to convince uh, this audience of this, but unfortunately there are some people that still need to be convinced of this, that vaccines work, quite simply. Um, so I think this is best viewed through uh, when you look at the disease incidence of things such as measles, mumps, uh, rubella, uh, before um, vaccines and now after vaccines, there's just a, you know, a dramatic decrease. Um, but I'd just like to point out, um, you know, there's a relative lack of uh, licensed um, effective oral vaccines, uh, particularly for uh, bacterial infections. Um, so we do have some oral vaccines uh, for rotavirus, you know, so there's Rotorix and Rotatech, uh, there's of course the polio vaccine. Um, but um, in, in terms of developing oral vaccines for diarrheal diseases, uh, such as Salmonella, E. coli, uh, Shigella, um, these diseases remain like a significant worldwide health issue. Um, there's still tens of millions of people uh, in the developing world that die of these diseases, and I think that um, this is best viewed um, here through disability life years lost. Uh, so the amount of uh, the burden um, in hospitals of uh, treating these patients, and, uh, and that accounts for around 15% of that as diarrheal diseases. And the, so the gold standard for this is the development of a vaccine. Now we know for these diarrheal diseases particularly, we can use antibiotics, but as Julian Davies nicely pointed out with the increasing incidence of antibiotic resistance, you know, we're really trying to develop you know, oral vaccines that are easy to use and effective for these um, diseases. But really the problem in the field, um, many people have been looking at this, is there's really a poor understanding of the determinants of protective gut immunity. And there's another phenomenon, which I'll get into, which uh, David Mills kind of alluded to as well, is vaccines have reduced efficacy and immunogenicity in uh, developing countries, um, specifically areas uh, with poor sanitation. Um, now, we've had three days of uh, great background into everything the microbiota does to the host. And uh, I think we know now um, there are specific uh, bacterial species that actually influence our immune system. So I don't need to convince you of this. So these are the three you know, best characterized examples in the field. Um, there's uh, Bacteroides fragilis uh, secreting polysaccharide A. Um, so Sarcus Masmanian's group has looked at that, inducing T regulatory cells. Um, Kenyon Honda has done some great work on specific clostridial species that can uh, induce T regulatory cells. And uh, segmentous filamentous bacteria can uh, lead to the proliferation of TH17 cells. Um, I don't think I need to convince you that shifts in the microbiota um, can actually influence uh, immune development. And this is also can be viewed through germ-free mice, which we know have reduced numbers and size of Peyer's patches and really just a lack of gut-associated lymphoid tissue, um, reduced levels of class switching to IgG and IgA antibodies, um, decreased number of CD4 positive T cells, and these uh, mice don't um, develop tolerance. But if you come in to a germ-free mouse with, with a complex uh, host-adapted uh, microbiota, we can now restore the intestinal immune system, so we need our microbiota for uh, immune development. Um, so uh, our lab um, posed the question a few years back, you know, given this, the profound impact the microbiota has on the development of our immune system, especially early in life, um, should human microbiome be considered when we're developing these vaccines? Uh, so our lab has been particularly interested in developing oral vaccines uh, for uh, diarrheal pathogens such as E. coli. We have a vaccine uh, for cattle. We're um, currently working on an oral uh, non-typhoidal vaccine for salmonella. Um, so given that we're working on this and we're also um, researching the microbiome field, um, we pose this question, and still is the early days. There's really not too much data, but I know there are groups working on this. And we wanted to ask the question, could our newfound knowledge of the impacts of the gut microbiota be a missing link to improve oral vaccine efficacy and develop more effective uh, oral vaccines. Um, so there's this phenomenon, uh, there's really a large body of evidence in the literature 
uh, suggesting that uh, oral vaccines, specifically polio, uh, rotavirus, um, cholera, uh, e-tech, show uh, a greatly reduced efficacy in developing countries, specifically regions uh, with poor sanitation compared to developed countries. Uh, a couple examples um, using the oral cholera vaccine as a tool to show this uh, is that uh, Nicaraguan children have blunted antibody responses compared to those in Sweden. And uh, there's a study by Myron Levine's group a few years back where they showed that uh, kids um, with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth also had blunted antibody responses. So, but we also know that you know, these, this phenomena of blunted vaccine responses to oral vaccines um, you know, could be due to, to a wide variety of issues uh, for people living in these areas of the world. Uh, you know, they live in these areas where they have increased antigen exposure. So if you come in with an oral antigen, um, the immune system uh, might react differently than it would here. Um, that's sort of the, the hygiene hypothesis idea. Um, of course, um, you know, a lot of these people are malnourished, and we know um, that, you know, this uh, is, uh, leads to nutrient deficiencies such as vitamin A. So what David Mills talked about, um, you know, there's hundreds of millions of people who are vitamin A deficient in many areas of the world, and you know, th that's an important pathway uh, in many immune pathways, the retinoic acid pathway. And also zinc is quite important. Um, you know, these people uh, use less antibiotics, and of course, I think the elephant in the room as well is the parasites. So they really have a greater uh, parasite burden in their gut compared to uh, here in more developed countries. However, I'd say that all of these changes can actually feed into your microbiota composition. Um, so, uh, and this is a study that's actually been uh, cited a, a n numerous times over the conference. It's one of the first studies to really look at the microbiota composition in uh, comparing uh, African uh, cohort to a cohort in the European Union. Um, so uh, what they saw is in the Burkina Faso, um, there's actually an increase in Prevotella and actually uh, microbes that can um, degrade carbohydrates. And then in the European Union, there's really an increase in the amount of, let's say, Clostridiales or Bacteroidetes that are um, involved in lipid metabolism. So we know now that diet can actually shift microbial assemblages, and there's really a difference in microbial assemblage in some of these areas of the world. And this sort of phenomenon of more Prevotella in the gut has been seen in other studies. And we also know from uh, some great work by uh, Jeff Gordon's group that malnutrition can actually shift the microbial community uh, as well. So could the microbiota be implicated as to why vaccines show reduced efficacy in uh, developing countries? And that's still an open question that I think many people are interested in. Um, what, there have been some uh, studies, um, you know, how can we solve this, right? So um, we're modulating the flora to try to use, you know, prebiotics or probiotics as adjuvants, per se, to, you know, actually help um, some of these vaccine responses. So there's been some small studies, mostly in mice, where they used um, uh, lactobacillus and uh, strains of bifidobacterium to actually improve uh, rotavirus, uh, cholera vaccine, and uh, Seminella typhi vaccine uh, efficacy, um, as well as prebiotics, um, fructooligosaccharide mixes um, to improve uh, Seminella vaccine and influenza vaccine responses. So there's some um, evidence that this might be uh, important. Um, so the question is, you know, can we manipulate the microbiota to improve um, vaccine responses. And similarly, there, I've been talking mostly about oral vaccine, but there is some evidence that in parental vaccines, uh, probiotics can be important as well, um, particularly early in life. So I think there's been a few great presentations that have shown the difference in microbiota after a C-section or uh, versus a vaginal delivery um, or formula feeding uh, versus uh, breast milk. Um, and this can actually decrease your probiotic uh, microorganisms uh, and, you know, what the effect this has on the vaccine responses um, remains to be seen. However, as David just suggested, you know, this could be an important uh, thing to realize um, in these kits. Um, but there's sort of, it's still in the early days, there's really a lack of long-term uh, follow-up studies. And uh, a lot, of, some studies do show variable effectiveness. You know, it's important to choose the right probiotic strain. And um, some mechanisms are unclear, but I think uh, David gave a great talk and about you know, possibly the need for symbiotics. So this could help with the colonization efficiency. And as I've seen, there's no studies as of yet where they've actually used more of a symbiotic approach um, uh, in terms of improving vaccine responses. So this could be an interesting area. Um, 
So another sort of paradigm I'd like to touch on is this idea that you know, we could actually maybe use probiotics to deliver vaccine antigens themselves. So there was some talk uh, yesterday about you know, there's this need to genetically manipulate some of these anaerobes and we need to kind of develop the tools of that. And one of the uh, translational applications of that could be actually getting these probiotics to uh, uh, actually display some vaccine antigens so we can get a lactobacillus possibly and you know, d deliver some vaccine antigens and have it colonize in the host. So there's a proof of concept study where they did this um, in a lactobacillus uh, lactis strain. Uh, so this is just proof of concept, but they made it express a listeria internalin. And they show that it actually internalizes and delivers the gene in the small intestine. So this could be you know, a way to deliver some sort of a, a DNA-based vaccine. Um, however, there's no real data on, on the efficacy in animals or humans as of yet. So this is just sort of a, a, a concept that could be thought of. But I think it's also important to point out with this concept that it could be relevant to what we now know about IgA responses. Uh, so Andrew McPherson's group has done some great work um, looking at IgA, and what they've seen is that you actually need constant exposure of oral antigen to elicit lifelong IgA responses. So if you come in with an oral antigen and look at a specific IgA years later, uh, it will be gone, but if you actually constantly um, expose the host to that antigen, it will help uh, mucosal IgA responses. Um, so there's a couple of studies I also want to highlight, and these are uh, actually from groups here in Maryland, uh, Marcelo Stein and uh, Claire Fraser. So they've done some stuff. Uh, this is uh, work in uh, macaques, where they've looked at the microbiota in vaccines. And uh, they looked at uh, macaques from uh, different uh, geographical regions, and they had different assemblages of uh, microbiota. And they came in with, with an oral Shigella vaccine. And uh, they showed that this vaccine actually really didn't have a change in the microbiota, um, however, after vaccination, uh, different macaques responded differently to infection. Um, so there is, uh, uh, actually got shigellosis only in certain macaques compared to others. So I won't really dive into the details of the study. Um, I think Claire is here today, so if you want to ask her, but it, I just wanted to point out that, you know, maybe we need to take the impact of the microbiota into consideration in some of these vaccine trials. You know, not all macaques are the same, of course, and not all humans are the same. Um, and so another study from the um, same uh, group is uh, looking in humans at um, oral typhoid vaccination. So there's an oral uh, typhoid strain, um, uh, TI 21A. Uh, and I, the, this is a great study, but what, just one thing I wanted to point out is they saw the same thing. No real change in the microbiota due to the vaccine. However, they split up the cell mediated response. Um, into a multiphasic response or late responders. And what they did see is if you had a more diverse microbiota, you actually had a greater multiphasic cell-mediated response to this vaccine. And this was actually shown more in the Clostridiales uh, groups. So this kind of, you know, this, these are correlative studies, of course, but they kind of hint to the importance of uh, our microbiota in, um, in oral vaccine responses. Um, so some of the work, uh, our lab is doing, we're actually working on murine models, and uh, we're testing different antibiotics uh, to uh, mice early in life, or uh, adult mice, and we're coming in with a different, uh, uh, either a salmonella peptide vaccine, or uh, ovalbumin uh, type mock vaccination, um, orally, um, and then uh, looking at the microbiota and looking at specific antibody and uh, T cell mediated readouts to see whether um, different um, microbiota shifts could actually shift our immune response to vaccines. So uh, we're still in the early days of this work, but some of the changes that we've seen is, have been in IgA responses. So we know we need diverse microbial exposure um, to get uh, proper levels of IgA. So in mice treated with vancomycin uh, from birth, they have a reduced amount of colonic T regulatory cells which have been known to be helper cells um, for IgA responses. So we see uh, a reduction in, uh, in the IgA response to these, uh, um, uh, the vaccine. And, but interestingly, when we took the adult mice and we treated with vancomycin, we actually saw an increase in the amount of IgA specific to the vaccine. And we think this is possibly a permeability issue. So that you know, at, from adulthood, they do have a developed immune system, but then the antigen can actually cross the barrier and be seen by the systemic immune system, which is also important in oral vaccination. Um, but you know, we're still in the early days, and you know, I think this conference has done a fabulous job of really addressing a lot of the sort of gaps, needs, and challenges in the field, and definitely in the area of uh, microbiome vaccines, such as such in the early days, there's 
a ton of challenges. Um, and this is something that a lot of people have touched on, but I'll just reiterate, is that, of course, um, people working with vaccines know that you, know, you want to get the vaccine to humans as quickly as possible. There's so many examples of vaccines that fail um, or that work in uh, animal models that actually turn up to not work in uh, humans. Um, so humans are much more relevant, but of course, when we're looking at shifts in the microbiota and correlating it to vaccine responses, as I, it's, just, it's correlative and you can't actually dive into the mechanism. Whereas if you're using uh, an animal model, whether it be a murine or a macaques, um, you know, this might have more poor translation um, to uh, humans. However, we can be more mechanistic uh, with the function. So I think we still need a balance of both. Um, and something that I know is an issue in these vaccine trials in humans is that, um, you know, we take the feces and we look at the microbiota composition and then we correlate that to vaccine responses. But fecal microbiota is just really the flow through of all the microbiota and you really lose that sort of spatial distribution and longitudinal distribution from the small intestine to the colon that some people have been talking about. And you just kind of get this community, but we're not really sure, you know, which ones are actually adhering to the mucosal surfaces. And I would argue that these ones would be more um, um, immunologically relevant. And, and just basically the same point, so it's difficult in humans to study these mucosa-associated microbiota. Um, you can take biopsies, of, but there are like ethical um, considerations there. Um, so there's a significant gap between animal and human studies. And what we need, and I know there are some groups interested in this, is uh, mice with humanized immune systems. Um, so you can actually take a mouse and give it sort of a more human-based immune system, uh, and now maybe we can come in with more of a human uh, microbiota, and this might be more translational to vaccine research. Now, you know, I think some sci scientists or uh, groups would pay, play, uh, pay a pretty penny <laughs> um, for actually maybe a germ-free mouse with a humanized immune system, and then come in with a humanized microbiota, and this could be sort of a need uh, in the field uh, for the future. Um, so for the last part of the talk, I'm going to shift gears um, and talk about something completely different. Um, still related to vaccines and microbiota, but this sort of idea is can we actually use vaccines to target specific species of the microbiota? And this might be a need um, as we begin to identify some of the keystone species or pathobionts or troublemakers per se in the gut. So we have, you know, probiotics that come in and try to tame those, but we could also maybe start to target them specifically because right now we really only have blunt tools at our disposal to do so. Um, uh, with lots of side effects, so that's such, of course, like dietary changes, antibiotics, uh, prebiotics, or even phage therapy. Um, so I think this is one study that uh, explains this, is that in periodontis, there's one species, uh, Porphyromonas gingivalis, that just the presence of this organism is kind of a troublemaker per se, so it influences the microbiota in the oral um, cavity around it to become more virulent. Um, and it's a, a, quite a low abundance organism, but it, it seems to have profound effects in this uh, disease. Um, so, you know, can we target this? And there have been groups, uh, there's one that looked at uh, periodontal vaccine. So can we target, um, you know, parts and constituents of the oral cavity to try to get rid of these, you know, pathobionts? So they uh, looked at um, an outer membrane porin, uh, FOM A, uh, from the species Fusobacterium nucleatum. And they, by targeting it, um, they kind of got rid of this bridge between uh, how porphyromonas um, enables uh, itself to form biofilms and cause gingivitis. So this worked in a mouse model of uh, gingivitis. So, and there's some more examples where we can maybe target pathobionts with vaccines, like the Haemophilus influenza B vaccine, um, which has virtually eliminated uh, this Haemophilus uh, from the pharyngeal microbiota. Um, so before the vaccine, there was asynchronous carriers about three to five percent. Uh, but now it's replaced by less virulent homophilus strains. Um, also, uh, streptococcal pneumonia, um, the valent vaccine, um, has seen a 77% decrease in disease, and this has been replaced by other non-vaccine strains that appear to be less virulent. So this opens up some questions, you know, can we target specific microbiota with vaccines? Um, and, you know, maybe they'll be replaced with sort of less virulent, uh, closely related species. Now, I realize that you know, anytime you see sort of autism and vaccines together in a sentence, it, it makes me cringe and it makes uh, scientists cringe. But you know, this is sort of a more of a, a provocative slide to say that you know, there's some uh, evidence coming out now uh, that actually autism is a 
is a GI uh, disease. Um, so 90% of autistic kids have some sort of GI irritation. And there's been studies that show there's this Clostridium bolti, or there's other clades of Clostridium that actually produce toxins that could go systemic into the bloodstream and possibly have neurological effects. So could we actually you know, target some of these um, pathobionts with some sort of a vaccine and sort of quell that, those effects? Now, there is some talk that, that this um, autism could also be sort of a gut permeability issue as well. So can we sort of target some of those metabolites that are produced and, you know, and try to get rid of uh, uh, some of those effects? But this is something that's sort of very new. Um, and there's also a, a group at Guelph uh, who is looking into this and so trying to make a vaccine specific for a cell wall polysaccharide immunogen um, from these clostridia and to see if we can actually um, you know, get rid of them. So, but I have to say, you know, given everything that's been talked about, um, you know, about the, I think, which is great about the ecosystem of the microbiota, um, you know, what could be the consequences of actually, you know, playing God and targeting these microbiota with vaccines? Um, so this is sort of virtually unexplored, but if you're targeting specific uh, constituents of the microbiota, you know, what are the ripple down effects in the community? And this is very difficult to predict. And I think uh, David Relman has done some great work in this area looking at um, the importance and interactions and ecosystem dynamics of the microbiota across the plains and how they actually turn uh, dysbiotic or not. So we need to know, it's still, there's still a need for this basic science to know the contribution of each species uh, to the community. Because we've got to remember this microbial ecosystem is a complex, adaptive system. It's nonlinear, so very small changes can have profound effects in the community. Um, and I think this is well known for microbial ecologists in the field. Um, so I'd just like to leave you um, with some future challenges and questions um, for the field. So one is, you know, can the microbiota be altered to improve vaccine responses? Um, can you actually use uh, microbiota to deliver vaccine antigens? And possibly can specific vaccines be designed to target uh, particular troublemaker uh, microbiota strains? And uh, with that, um, I'd just like to acknowledge Brett and the lab and uh, and thank uh, for a great conference. Thanks. <laughs>